The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. When you find yourself in desperate trouble, wouldn't it be comforting to hear someone say reassuringly, don't be afraid of our enemies. There are more on our side than theirs. Well, that's an incident that actually happened in the Bible. It's found in 2 Kings chapter 6, where the prophet Elisha prayed for the Lord to open the eyes of his servant, to see supernatural horses and chariots of fire protecting all around them. Elisha declared, don't be afraid of our enemies. There are more on our side than on theirs. Indeed, God's angelic armies have been involved in Israel's miraculous wars, and there's more to come. Amid a string of recent deadly terrorist attacks and signs of the looming prophetic Ezekiel War, the Israel Defense Forces have launched the largest military exercise in the history of modern Israel. And it's been called by the biblical name, Chariots of Fire. The month-long drill is simulating a multi-front war against Israel's enemies on land, in the air, at sea, and also in cyberspace. Thousands of soldiers, Air Force and Navy, as well as reservists are being called upon to participate in the unprecedented massive drill. Jesus taught that the Jewish people would indeed be living once again in the land of Israel at the time of his second coming and that Jerusalem would be surrounded by enemies. But meanwhile, stones are being carved for the rebuilding of the third temple. And Israel is once again asking for their ancient temple treasures to be returned from the Vatican. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. Israel continues to prosper economically in the region, but terrorism and anti-Semitism remain major menaces so that Israel is having to engage in its largest drill ever to improve the readiness of its entire military against enemy forces. Also this year, for the first time, cities across Israel scrapped fireworks for the country's 74th Independence Day out of consideration for military veterans who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. This year's celebrations in more than a dozen cities, including Tel Aviv, were not accompanied by the booms of fireworks. Israeli authorities in Jerusalem opted for a silent pyrotechnic show. The decision to tone down fireworks came after increasingly vocal concerns from war-weary former soldiers who say that the noisy fireworks bring back the horrors of warfare. Fireworks are spectacular to watch, but for veterans, they only trigger the memories of battle sounds. And there was another development on Independence Day that largely went unnoticed. A small group of religious Jews gathered in Jerusalem's old city to begin chipping away at stones to be used to build the third temple. The event was organized by Rabbi Aryeh Lippo, who ascends to the Temple Mount on a daily basis or whenever the Israeli police permit Jews to enter. Recently, Rabbi Lippo and a friend were studying a Torah ruling written by the famous late Rabbi Kanievsky, stating that the stones for the temple should be cut by Jews with the intention of honoring God's name. Rabbi Lippo told the press, we have a Torah commandment to build a temple, and this commandment, or mitzvah, is not conditional or time-bound. He said Jews have this requirement at all times. So he said it's a pity that we're not actively engaged in rebuilding the temple. Well, right now it's politically complicated, but the rabbi said that doesn't exempt the Jewish people from doing this important mitzvah. Rabbi Lippo believes it's possible to begin by preparing the stones that will eventually be used later to build the third temple. The medieval Torah authority known as the Rambam 
taught that the stones for the temple were cut outside of the Temple Mount and transported to the site. And once on the Temple Mount, it was forbidden to use iron tools to form the stones. Of course, it was forbidden to use iron tools at any stage to form the stones for the altar. In order to perform the mitzvah properly, Rabbi Lippo consulted with several rabbis considered to be experts in issues concerning the temple. Lippo said that all the rabbis who were consulted agreed that he should proceed. He said, we had to be very careful about our intentions because this was not to be a political statement. The intention was to unify the Jews in making God one and his name one. It was for this reason that Rabbi Lippo chose to begin forming the stones for the third temple on Israel's Independence Day. He said on this day, 74 years ago, Israel became a state, but the essence of the nation is the temple in Jerusalem. Rabbi Lippo and his group of temple devotees had collected 23 sizable stones from a field near a community in biblical Samaria. The community is called Esh Kodesh, meaning holy fire. A contractor transported the stones to an area near the Herva Synagogue in the Old City's Jewish Quarter. Lippo plans to organize more events in the future to prepare more stones for the Third Temple. Among those taking part in the recent stone chipping event was Orthodox Jewish radio host Joshua Wander. He posted photos on his Facebook page. While cutting the stones, Wander wore on his forehead a phylactery that Jewish men wear during morning prayers. Inside the small black leather cube is a piece of parchment inscribed with verses from the Torah. Also, Wander had his sidearm ready to personify a verse from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 12, which says that when the Jews rebuilt the second temple, each had his sword girded at his side as he was building, and the trumpeter stood beside them. Rabbi Lippo said, we had the intention to show that we are actively working to bring the third temple. And this was a prophetic act and a message to the nation and to the world. As well, he said, is to God himself, saying that religious Jews are not just sitting around and doing nothing while waiting for Messiah. The word of God poses a question in Haggai chapter 1, verse 4. Is it a time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while God's house is lying in ruins? So just as the prophet Haggai in his day sought to break the complacency of the people, Rabbi Lippo and many others are rising up to prepare the future temple. But meanwhile, a major piece of the end time puzzle is still missing. The requirement of a perfect red cow to sacrifice for purification purposes is a challenging biblical commandment and one that continues to capture the imaginations of both Jews and Christians alike. The preparation and purpose of the red cow or red heifer, as described in Numbers chapter 19, is part of the whole process in order to renew the temple sacrificial system. You see, the entire temple service in the future depends upon the necessity of biblically prescribed holy water mixed with the ashes of a sacrificial red heifer. According to Numbers 19, an unblemished, never-before-yoked red heifer must be slaughtered and burned in order to restore ritual purity to those who had become unclean through contact with the dead. It's for this reason that Jews are religiously forbidden from entering the area that was once the inner court of the temple. Religious Jews who do ascend the Temple Mount first immerse themselves in a ritual bath, but that's only good enough to allow entrance into the area of the outer courts, but not to be confused with the sanctuary area itself. The bottom line is that without the ashes of the red heifer, purification ceremonies for the temple cannot begin. Religious Israelis are doing everything they can to make all the necessary preparations for the building of the third temple, and that includes pure breeding a stock of red heifer calves to try to come up with one that is perfect and fits the biblical prescription. 
Rehearsals are also being done for the ceremonial burning of such a calf with no blemishes. The Temple Institute is experimenting with a meticulous rabbinic ritual surrounding the red heifer ceremony. The effort includes burning a dead cow on a wooden altar. According to the Jewish Voice news portal, Professor Zohar Amar of Bar Ilan University took part in a recent red heifer experiment, and he described it as an historical moment moving towards the renewal of purity in Israel. According to Torah regulations, into the fire along with a heifer are also thrown cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet dyed wool. All these are prophetic pictures pointing to the merits of Messiah when he made atonement on the cross. In fact, I found this fascinating. Chapter 8 of the Epistle of Barnabas, not the Gospel of Barnabas, but the Epistle of Barnabas, equates the red heifer as being a type of Jesus, the Messiah. Barnabas was a companion of the Apostle Paul, and he wrote his epistle between A.D. 70 and A.D. 132. The complete text of the Epistle of Barnabas is preserved in the 4th century Codex Sinaiticus, and some early Christians consider the Epistle of Barnabas to be part of the New Testament canon. The Epistle of Barnabas has many similarities to the letter to the Hebrews. Barnabas wrote that the commandment was given to Israel to offer a heifer, to slaughter and burn it, and then the Israelites should take up the ashes and cast them into vessels along with scarlet wool and a tree, a type of the cross with a scarlet wool and hyssop. And this being done, they should sprinkle the people one by one that they would be purified from their sins. Barnabas wrote, understand how in all plainness the calf is a type of Jesus. And those who sprinkle are they that preach to us the forgiveness of sins and the purification of our heart. Well, in light of all of the activity concerning the rebuilding of another temple, which is of immense interest to both Jews and Christians, I've been meditating on whether or not Bible prophecy actually demands that a third temple be rebuilt and actually standing in place prior to the rapture, the catching away, or the second coming of Jesus. You see, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 3 to 4, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day of the appearing of the Lord will not come unless the falling away comes first, and then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, Paul was speaking of the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, I checked 25 different English versions of that passage, and they all translated the Greek word in this verse for temple as naos. However, Young's literal translation for 2 Thessalonians 2.4 renders naos as the word sanctuary. While generally translated as temple, the Greek word naos more accurately refers to an inner sanctum. Strong's Dictionary of New Testament Words explains that naos is used generally of the temple at Jerusalem, and naos is also used generally to refer to spirit-filled believers as the temple of God in the church age. But more specifically, naos means only the sanctuary itself, consisting of the holy place and the holy of holies, and not the entire temple enclosure. For example, in classical Greek, naos is used to describe the core cell of a temple where the image of a god was placed, and is therefore to be distinguished from the entire temple complex. So, Paul literally said the Antichrist will set up an abomination in the vicinity of the holy of holies. Now, additionally, let's look in the New Testament to see what Jesus said prophetically about the holy place in the last days concerning the abomination that will desecrate it in the future. Matthew 24, 15 records the warning of Jesus where he said to the Jewish people, run to the hills when you see the awful horror 
of which the prophet Daniel spoke, standing in the holy place. And then the verse adds a parenthetical note to the reader, understand what this means. So let's do that. Let's try to understand. In Matthew 24, 15, quoting Jesus, the word naos, meaning sanctuary or temple, is not used. But rather, Jesus said, when you see the abomination standing in the what? In the holy place. So this can mean the area on the Temple Mount where it's believed the Holy of Holies once existed. Yes, a physical building could fulfill this verse, but an open space or a tented space could also fulfill this generic description of the holy place. Think about that. That could possibly mean that Bible prophecy concerning the Antichrist could be fulfilled before any temple is actually erected. The Antichrist could merely set up his abominable idol or his seat somewhere on the Temple Mount that is considered the holy place. Or there could be a functioning tabernacle on the spot that he desecrates. Now, Daniel 9.27 gives us additional information. Daniel 9.27 foretells the abomination of the Antichrist, but doesn't mention the word temple. Daniel 9.27 says the Antichrist will put a stop to sacrifices and offerings, which implies some sort of worship facility will exist. But interestingly, Daniel 9.27 also says the abomination will take place on a wing, W-I-N-G. I looked up this word wing in the Hebrew and it is konof, meaning on the edge or at the extremity of something. So this is only speculation, but it could be that the Antichrist will set up an abominating idol on the edge or in the general vicinity of what's believed to have been the Holy of Holies somewhere on the Temple Mount. I offer all of this up prayerfully only to indicate how late the hour really is because the Jews are determined to build their temple. But these prophecies indicate that the Antichrist might not even need a fully functioning temple in order to fulfill prophecy and desecrate the holy place. Religious Jews believe to this day that the divine presence, the Shekinah, has never left the Western Wall area, which is like a huge open-air synagogue. Now then, when a golden menorah for a third temple has been designed, as well as many of the accoutrements for the priesthood and the sacrificial system, there's also an intriguing ongoing subplot in the news from time to time concerning the previous temple treasures. The question remains, will the former temple treasures be found and will they be incorporated into the yet to be built new temple? Harry Moshkoff is an investigative archaeologist and temple scholars, and he has just returned from another foray into the Vatican in Rome where he believes many of the ancient temple treasures are stashed. These would be the sacred and precious relics that were originally part of the second temple that existed nearly two millennia ago, in which was visited, of course, by Jesus and his disciples. According to Harry Moshkoff, several persons are alive who can personally attest to being eyewitnesses of temple vessels, including the seven-branch menorah candelabra, located in a cave below the Vatican. The Arch of Titus in Rome was constructed to commemorate the victory of Titus with his father, Emperor Vespasian, over the Jewish rebellion in Judea. The arch depicts the triumphal procession celebrated in 71 AD after the Roman victory, culminating in the fall of Jerusalem. And the arch provides a contemporary depiction of artifacts of the Herodian temple. The menorah depicted on the arch actually served as the model for the emblem of the state of Israel. After over 25 years of research into the whereabouts of the lost temple treasures, temple scholar Harry Moshkoff claims he knows of the existence of the oldest and very fragile Torah scroll that was taken from the second temple. Other priceless treasures include the golden headplate of the high priest engraved with the holy name of God. 
and the giant curtain that hung from the temple entrance, as well as temple trumpets and various other ritual copper utensils documented by the Jewish historian Josephus. In fact, Josephus records the event in which Emperor Vespasian took for himself these items specifically as his special treasures for safekeeping, including that ancient Torah scroll. Well, one of the great rabbis at the beginning of the 20th century, the chief rabbi of Libya, Rabbi Yitzhak Chai Bozovka, met Italy's King Emmanuel III in Tripoli, and the king invited the rabbi to attend the wedding of his son, the prince, in Rome in 1930. The rabbi was entertained like royalty in Rome, and after he blessed the prince's marriage, the king asked the rabbi if there was anything he wished. The rabbi responded that he desired to see the holy vessels of the Jewish temple in the cellars of the Vatican. The king managed to convince the pope to allow the rabbi to visit a cave hidden under the Vatican to see the treasures. And upon exiting, the rabbi's face reportedly was shining, and he never said another word until his death 40 days later. Another famous rabbi, Benjamin, was a well-known Iberian traveler who kept accurate travel logs, as noted by his contemporaries. When the rabbi passed through Rome in the 12th century, he noted that in Rome there is the cave where Titus, the son of Bespatian, stored the temple vessels that he brought from Jerusalem. But where is the factual, tangible proof that the Vatican inherited these sacred items and retains them until today? Well, in 2002, a Jewish student who was formerly enrolled at the Vatican's university apparently gave sufficient proof to the then Israeli foreign minister, Shimon Peres, that he had been an eyewitness to the treasures. The former student also gave testimony to others who were in negotiations with Vatican officials. The question now remains, should Israel make use of today's international laws of repatriation? Unfortunately, to return the treasures to Israel, their rightful owners, isn't politically correct. But the treasures always will be Jewish, and so their home is ultimately in Jerusalem, Israel's capital, and more importantly, Jerusalem is the city of God. Harry Moshkoff speculates that some arbitrary ruling may come forth from the UN in their typical anti-Israel manner that might designate the lost temple treasures as something other than Jewish. That's a very real danger because we've seen how in recent times the UN has designated the Temple Mount as entirely Muslim. Yes, unbelievably, in December 2021, the United Nations General Assembly approved a resolution, 129 to 11, that disavowed Jewish ties to the Temple Mount. And the resolution called the contested real estate solely by its Muslim name, Al-Haram Al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary. Israel's ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan, accused the Palestinians of attempting to erase Jewish history. Ironically, as we have pointed out in previous videos, the Muslims actually printed a guide to the Temple Mount in 1925 in which the pamphlet stated that it was beyond dispute that this was once the site of Solomon's Temple. Yet, unbelievably, 129 nations ignored Jewish ties to the Temple Mount, calling it solely Muslim. The United States opposed the text and said that the omission of inclusive terminology in the resolution, saying that the site is sacred to three faiths, was of real and serious concern. In the meantime, Harry Moshkoff claims a team of lawyers and ambassadors is joining him in trying to reclaim those treasures. Moshkoff stated in a Jerusalem Post article that the state of Israel should start preparing a legal repatriation case, arguing that the ancient temple artifacts, wherever they may be, fully belong in Jerusalem as the everlasting national heritage of the Jewish people. We know that ultimately the God of Israel is in control of all of this and of unfolding Bible prophecy. 
But with so much Bible prophecy coming to pass at breakneck speed and the world becoming a place where good is called evil and evil is called good, I'm not surprised that many believers have begun to grow weary. So in closing today, I'd like to offer some personal encouragements for our perilous times. Psalm 27 verse 13 says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of of the living. Now is not the time to lose heart. The Lord is coming and the great devotional streams in the desert asks, what do we do when we are about to faint physically? Well, when you're fainting, you can't really do anything for yourself, but you fall upon the shoulder of some strong loved one and you rest, you lie still and you trust. And it's like that when we're tempted to faint under pressure or affliction. God knows when our strength and courage are waning. So he tells us, be still and know that I am God. I was so touched to read about the end of the life of the great British missionary Hudson Taylor, founder of the China Inland Mission. Taylor spent 51 years in China. And after accomplishing great exploits in his last days, he became so feeble that he dictated a letter saying, I'm too weak to write. I can't read my Bible. I can't even pray. The only thing I can do is lie still in God's arms and trust like a little child. Wow. That powerful man of God came to a place of physical weakness where he could only lie still and trust in God. Many of my friends who were struck with the COVID virus have felt that week. In these dark days that still brim with opportunities, if we sense that we're growing faint, let's determine to stay firm and let our hearts take new courage. God will sustain us and bring us through so that in His strength, we can be strong and accomplish exploits, as Daniel 11.32 says, before the soon return of Jesus. Amen. Well, as always, I want to challenge you to dare to confess with me what the Bible declares, that we're all sinners in need of the world's only Savior. Jesus, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, and he came to die on our behalf. And if you do believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible declares you shall be saved. Hallelujah. May God empower each one of us to be awake, ready for the Lord's imminent return with hearts full of steadfast faith. The topic of a new temple in Jerusalem always prompts comments or questions. So you can contact me through social media or be sure to check out our website, exploits.tv. We also offer many articles and eBooks available at our website on a variety of important subjects, including this one, All eyes riveted on the Temple Mount. And so until our next time together, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dard. Shalom and Maranatha.